everyone. To um, discuss the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. The superintendent recommends entering executive session. It's the same thing. Yeah. So, um, motion to move into executive session. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. We will move into executive session and we'll be back at 7 o'clock to start the normal meeting. Here we're going to begin. Welcome to the Iroquois Central School Board of Education meeting. There are two recognition of guest periods one for gender related items and one for other topics. Please refrain from personal related comments and, and address those to the appropriate administrator. To speak, fill out the proper form and submit it to the district clerk. Public comment is limited to 15 minutes total, with each speaker allowed up to three minutes. This meeting is held in public rather than a public meeting. And while we won't engage in dialogue tonight, we are listening. This meeting is live streamed and the recording will be posted. We'd like to move on and welcome Marilla for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. That's you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Now we will move to an update on the Family Support Center. Here we go. Hi everybody. Hi Chris. So we're going to spend a little bit of time, I know we have a big agenda tonight, so we probably won't, you know, talk as long about this as we would like to, because we have a lot going on, but we're going to do our best to update you in a, you know, efficient manner here. Um, I think it's super important to know that, you know, as we welcome Julia into this role, um, you know, I've been around these programs for a long time, and I've spent some time around the best of them. When I tell you that we're lucky to have Julie here with us is, is an understatement. She's, you know, she's six to eight weeks into this job, and the work that she's done already has been nothing short of impressive. Um, so I, I think you know, my first step here is to acknowledge that in front of all of you guys and to give her the, the props she deserves for coming in under some pretty tense you know, um, circumstances and really crushing it. So we're going to spend some time talking about that um, and updating you guys. But... You know, you, you've got the PowerPoint. It's up here. You can see Julia's um, background and, and what she does. Um, you know, we, we've developed this very basic, simple mission that the Family Support Center's mission is to assist families in obtaining affordable, accessible resources to meet their needs. Period. Simple. Direct. Right? Because that's really what we're, you know, what we're, what we're about at this point. Um, again, um, a little bit of background. Um, I stumbled across this, uh, you know, a month or so ago, which I thought was very timely. Um, this came out of the New York State School Boards Association um, on board um, newsletter that they send out. You can see it was, it was September 23rd. Um, I thought this was pretty, um, uh, speaks loudly to the work that we're doing now. Um, if you take a look at some of those stats, that's pretty significant. You know, that's, that's um, uh, you're talking in each one of those categories, nearly 50% or more um, of parents feeling stressed, feeling anxiety, feeling overwhelmed. Um, and, you know, this was a pretty good cross-section of, you know, of the population. That's the APA. They did it in 2023. It's a very recent survey. Um, and I think this captures uh, kind of our mission, in a sense, you know, right here in this report in front of us. Um, 
those are the families that we're talking about, the families that are feeling that way, the, the students that are feeling that way, the, you know, the, the, the way that that affects kids in school and their performance in school. Those are our target, that's our target population here, as I think you guys remember from our conversations before. We started, um, as we sat down to, to put something together and come up with a plan, um, one of the first things that we decided to do was put out a, a needs assessment. Um, you know, we wanted to see what we, th what the community thought they needed or wanted, what the students thought they needed or wanted, and our staff as well. Um, so we, we found, um, we actually developed a uh, pretty, you know, basic, you guys may have seen it, it went out in email a few times, I'm sure you all got it, don't know if you had a chance to look through it or not, but um, that was kind of a starting point as we were doing some other work behind the scenes, which we'll, we'll get to in a little bit. Um, we kind of started with this. Um, if I'm being completely honest, I, you know, we didn't get the feedback in quantity that we wanted this time around, um, but we wanted to get something out there. You know, part of the purpose was also to let people know, hey, we're here. We've got this. We're, we're building this. Um, and, you know, it's something that we, we really think is important and want some information on. So, you know, as you can see, uh, this is how we, we kicked it out this time around. We have some plans for the future to get some better turnout. As you can see, the response rates, you know, weren't, weren't great. Um, 65 students, 72 staff, 67 um, community and family members, really family members. Um, you know, and of the 65 students, I think it's also important to note, just in full transparency, that a third of them were fifth graders, which means I think a teacher, you know, did what we hoped they would do and opened up the computers and said, hey, kids, let's do this. Um, so the rest of the numbers, the other two-thirds, are a, a pretty, so pretty good selection of 6 through 12, although the numbers, again, weren't the quantity that we wanted. Um, so kind of taking a stroll through this, um, this was... Um, one of the questions um, for the students was regarding what they felt were the biggest issues that they face in school right now. So this is a, a summary of that. Um, and just to kind of highlight the top four or five, you can see that social media issues was what they felt from the students that responded a big issue for them. That was number one. And I, I think we can all probably agree with that. That's been a thing for a while. We know that social media is an issue. Um, you know, learning to, to control it or somehow manage it is, you know, if any one of us could figure that out, pretty rich and I you know think we could probably be on a beach somewhere right now kicking back um, but that's a big challenge uh, the second one as you can see is anxiety they didn't specify there wasn't a, a specific nature of the anxiety but the feeling of anxiety and stress um, is something that, that the kids pointed out as being uh, an issue for them um, difficulty managing anger and intense emotions was another in the top five you know kind of goes along with the anxiety but it's their feelings of of stress um, or, you know, dealing with whatever it is that they've got to deal with at home, at school, in the community that's stood out. Um, and, you know, you can, you can kind of take a look down the rest there and see what they are, but th there's a theme there um, for sure, um, which, again, I know it's a limited data set, but it plays right into this concept that we were starting to build and, and the target area that we really want to um, spend some time on as, as this continues to grow. Um, this doesn't surprise me. Um, this was the strength areas, and as you, can, as you can see, I've arranged them by student, staff, and, and community. Um, most of the positives were things that we would all identify in this room. If, if someone said, hey, Chris, what do you think are the coolest things about your school district? If anybody in this room was asked that, we'd probably come up with these sorts of things. Safe. Um, the school system is top notch. You know, you can see in the feedback there that we've got a good variety of, of sports, um, for sure. Um, that people are caring, they're supportive, all these great things that we want of our school district. This was not surprising. Now, one thing that stood out a little bit um, was if you dig deep into some of the comments, which I didn't put them all in here, you know, one of the things that um, some folks struggled with was uh, the fact that we, in their opinion, um, while we are good at providing sports and, you know, activities you know, related to sports for kids, we, we lack a little bit in arts and other areas because um, not every kid's an athlete. Um, and again, it wasn't a huge number. It was just there, so I thought it was something to, to point out. But um, overall, you can see the feedback about our strengths is, is overwhelmingly positive. So when you look at this, this is kind of the summary of the unmet need. Um, it was another question, you know, in the survey asked to all three areas. 
um, student staff and community. And if you look through this, the theme is the same. Um, need for support for families outside of school, outside of the school day. Mental health support. Um, social emotional support. Um, outside of the school day, help for parents, for kids. Uh, again, that's a pretty common theme here, which again, falls in line with all that we've been trying to establish and set up here. So although, again, the numbers weren't great, there's still a theme here, there's still a pattern that, you know, falls right into uh, play here for us. Um, nothing stood out, you know, really large to me in this one, except for the common theme throughout the three areas. The next few slides are taken out of the feedback, which I think sometimes this is more important than the, you know, the, the click the button to get the data um, sets that we look at. These are quotes, direct quotes from uh, the three different areas that we, we studied. So again, as you look through these, you know, these two are talking about, you know, supports lacking um, for mental health. Um, the one, you know, the one comment there on the left side is, you know, we need to learn that you can't discipline away a mental health issue. Um, again, this is student feedback. I thought that was kind of significant. Um, the, the other one there is about social services and counseling being more widely available uh, to students um, and students knowing you know, where to go and how to get it. Staff feedback, and these aren't highlighted for any reason other than just to break up the, the text for you guys because it, it's kind of wordy and it's a lot. Um, but again, staff feedback, if you look through this, there's a theme. Supporting families in the district that are of uh, more vulnerability to crisis. Um, the high need families, the ones that are in more rural areas um, that might not have as easy access to support. Um, you talk about families who are struggling to find professional help for their students. Um, the, the third one down there specifically says, you know, we continue to put Band-Aids on serious wounds. Um, but I think that's just because there's a lot going on right now in kids. Um, and we're still struggling to keep up with that and, and meeting all of those needs. Um, but again, the theme here is the same. You know, the need for additional support, additional trainings, um, additional resources uh, for kids and families. This is from the community. Uh, again, similar theme, access to services they can't get due to proximity, due to transportation, due to the things that they don't have. Um, you know, Family Resource Center on the right talks about beginning to connect families to these supports. So again, not to read through these, you know, in their entirety for you, but the theme is the same. Every single one, every single group um, is basically speaking the same language at this point. So it was good. Again, the number's low, but it's good to get that, that feedback and understand that, um, you know, there is a theme here. There is a need. I'm going to turn this over to Julia because I talk a lot and you guys know I can ramble forever and I really want you to get to know Julia um, since you already know me. So we're going to, Julia's going to talk a little bit over the next few slides about what we've accomplished uh, and kind of what our goals are moving forward. Hi everyone. Um, so currently within the last eight weeks, um, our big thing was targeting our really high needs families. These are families that are lacking in financial security, food security, um, homelessness, clothing. Is that good? Okay. Is that good? Okay. Um, so we really wanted to target those higher needs families who have needs that are harder to obtain, who have least accessibility, um, whether that's transportation, more of those rural areas, specifically like our Wales primary. Um, so I've been working with that. We targeted ab about our top 15 families throughout the district, um, connecting them with clothing, food, shelter, um, getting them linked with financial resources. I've worked a lot with getting out in the community, um, building those partnerships, specifically with the Rural Outreach Center. Um, I know that has been a really big thing in Iroquois. I hear that a lot when I was getting to know counselors and social workers and teachers. Um, and then when me, Chris and I met the Rural Outreach Center, we were able to uncover a lot more resources that they're able to provide, um, such as like free legal services for families, whether that's a family who is dealing with um, the Department of Social Services, um, we're looking to foster, we're looking for our grandparents who are raising kids, looking to adopt those grandchildren. Um, so we partnered with them. Um, a big thing too is also creating those mental health resources inside the school, so the school-based satellites. Um, I'm actually really happy to announce that today we were able to secure a partnership with Horizons. Um, so they will hopefully be starting 
um, the beginning of next semester, building those um, relationships with students, being able to provide those mental health services in school, specifically for our families who might not be able to get transportation to take them to outside counseling services, um, especially in the area that we are in. It's like a 15, 20 minute drive um, to the closest private practice or clinic setting, um, which is where a lot of our families have to go because they accept most top insurances. Um, our short-term goals with the one to three years um, continue to build these partnerships. Um, currently, we have about 12 partnerships, um, some private practice counselors, some um, clinic counselors, um, and then other places in the community as well. Um, continue to build on those. I would like to get an abundance of resources um, for families who aren't just looking for mental health or substance use services, um, but maybe families looking for those legal services or families looking for um, food to help put food on the table on the weekend. Um, so like getting to know food banks in the area, um, things like that. Um, as I already mentioned, establishing um, more mental health services, Horizons, we were able to get reaching out to other clinics that accept those majority insurances like Medicaid, um, Independent Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So our families are able to um, obtain accessible and affordable resources and they won't have to pay out of pocket for that. Um, we would also like to get into um, programs within the school too, not just getting out in the community, um, but hygiene lockers. I know we had them for a little bit here, getting those reinstated, especially for our McKinney-Vento students. Um, snack cabinets and school supplies, snack cabinets um, for the students who might not be able to afford a snack. Um, they can run down, grab a snack during snack time, be able to con continue on with their day. Um, in the next two to three years, I'd like to start pursuing grants to help fund um, some of our programs, um, specifically, again, mental health. Um, if families can't afford it, being able to secure grants so then we're able to help those families pay for the services that they need. Um, again, helping them break down any barriers we possibly can to get them what they need at that time. I think it's important, just let me add this real yeah. quick, that the net, I, I don't want to understate the network you've done and the connections that you've made with other area family support centers. So, you know, we're not, this isn't an island that we're working on. Um, you know, Clarence is now, a, has a pretty significant family support center that they built, and Julie's got a good relationship with them, in addition to, you know, Sweet Home Penmore, some of the ones that have been established for a long time. So the ability for her to get in and speak with those other folks, to network, um, is powerful. Because there's strength in numbers there, and, you know, like, as an example, today, yeah, a coalition yeah. meeting, um, that she went to, and, and I think if you guys might remember, in the summer when I was here last, we talked about the coalition, and we talked about the amount of districts that are part of that coalition, and that has actually grown since we last met. If I'm not mistaken, I think that the info that we learned today was that there's one district in the area now that does not have one. Um, don't necessarily need to name who it is, it's from North Town, not South Town here. Um, but, you know, we're, we're right on track here with what we're doing, and everybody's kind of tagging along. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like the coalition meetings, um, Clarence also um, conducts advisory meetings where they allow people to have the opportunity to um, network and get to build um, those partnerships, um, which has actually led me to be able to build some of the partnerships that we have today from that opportunity. Um, and then for our three to five year plan, I would really like to set up our own advisory committee, um, being able to get family involvement. Another response that we noticed a lot was doing stuff for the family. So like family fun days, getting families more involved into the district, um, not just revolving mental health, but just revolving being there, supporting their kids while they um, continue with their school journey. Um, so I would really like to get that set up and running, um, provide a system for families where they don't have to ask for help, um, this is a really big thing. As a social worker, I was always taught, you know, we, we want to put ourselves out of jobs, right? Our whole goal is to be able to help people and help them find places and help that they need. So eventually they don't need us anymore. Uh, with the Family Support Center, right now we are looking for those higher referrals. We want high referral cases. Um, we want people to outreach to us and ask for help. Um, but in about five years, I'd really like to see those referrals go down um, because that means I'm doing my job. It means families know where help is. Families find it a safe and comfortable place to be able to outreach on themselves. And then just maintaining those partnerships, maintaining those um, resources so then families can continue to have them at their disposal. 
Um, again, expanding grant funding sources to help pay for various things, um, whatever the school may need at that time, specifically those students, again, mental health, um, trainings for staff if we need those as well. Um, like I said, just continue to maintain partnerships, build satellites. Um, Horizons is not the only satellite I would like to have. I would like to have an abundance of satellites, um, especially with primaries being at different locations too. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> first, um, yeah, first of all, yes, um, welcome, Julia. Thank you. It's uh, great to have you. Um, and you know, all seriousness, you know, you've done a lot, um, and, and the scope of what's before you is immense. And and I know at some point, you know, resources and that will be discussion. The the question I have is though, is how do we, you know, help you, and how do you make sure? that the students and the families know that you exist and are, are comfortable coming to talk to you yeah. when they need help. And, and like the, um, not to parallel, but like the SROs have built a very good relationship with the students where the students are very comfortable going to them and they know they're there. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, you know, pl plan to do that? Because that's a big thing because if they don't know you're there and they don't trust, then they don't come to you and then we can't or you can't help them. Right. Um, so that's definitely where, like, that um, community involvement comes in. Um, so that's, like, me reaching out to Tracy at the Boys and Girls Club, volunteering there any way I can um, for advertisement purposes. Um, we do have the Rural Outreach Center coming here and presenting with the Family Support Center to be able to um, present to families resources that they have and how they can help families at this time. Um, those family fun days, getting um, me out there, you know, putting a face to a name, um, getting people know that I'm here, that um, with the stigma of mental health, I'd really like to hold off on bringing mental health into that at that point and just getting families, parents, and students to just come, know we're here, have a great time. Um, but it is a person-centered approach. Um, with the families I've worked with so far, not every case is the same. Um, some families just want a name and a phone number um, for those mental health resources, some families want to come in and sit down with me and talk. Um, I am just doing my best to be able to um, accommodate those families. Um, I don't want families to feel pressured. I want them to feel comfortable. And it's kind of just gaining that trust with them, knowing I'm here, knowing that I can be a separate entity from the school if they would like that too. I think to be a little bit more direct and specific, maybe some activities that we have planned. Julie did mention the, the December 4th. We're um, bringing the rock here. We're inviting the community in here. We're planning family fun days. She's planning family fun days. The whole purpose of that is to get her in front of people. Um, you know, she wants to get out in buildings. You know, once we get over the hump of getting the ball rolling, it's just visibility. It's just talking. It's communicating. It's reaching out and just being this. Like the SRO, that's a great um, example. You know, what we want to do. Just getting out and talking. And I truly think it's, you know, hearing this, it's really remarkable. I just think it's such a large issue. It's such a large concern um, that it's, you know, large. To answer your question, what we need to do for us, just continue to support us. You know, as we, as we post these things, as we um, start to continue to build, you know, just the, the word of mouth from you guys, if you're in the community, as you're talking to people, as you're in buildings, it's any bit of a little bit of that kind of support helps. Uh, I think people are still a little bit nervous. Like, you know, she's, we've got referrals. Um, each of the buildings have sent us there to the most challenging families. We've connected with some of them, but some are still a little like, wait, what's this? Family group, what? Kind of thing. And, and we're not making cold calls. You know, it's, it, there's legwork to be done by the counselors in the buildings first before Julia makes the phone call. So there's still this, it's very new. No, you're, build, you're building it out. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're building as we're flying. Really. It, it's exciting because you're building from scratch, but it's, <laughs> you know, exciting and, you know, scary at the same time. Yeah. Same time, because it's not a blueprint. Can I, uh, um, one thing that we, we often forget about are the students in our district that don't actually attend our school. They go to a private school or a home school. Have you done any kind of outreach to those students? Because they're just as much our responsibility as the ones that are actually attending our buildings. I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. Because that's something that's super important to me, right? Because I agree with that. They are, they are students, period. Whether they, they attend one of these buildings that we have or not, they're still ours. I think that is, um, working with those families is, is the next layer you know, in, in the project because I know our out of district families pretty well. I know our home school families pretty well. Um, and there are some families that certainly have some significant needs. So they're not lost in 
business. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to that point yet, um, but that is part of the problem. For sure. Do you have a sense of the number of partners that are out there, like total available partners that you're trying to bring in, right? So you brought in Horizon as an example, or The Rock, which is amazing, that's great. But what does that look like for 20, 30 square mile, whatever that radius is that you want to put around it? What's that sort of look like that's available today that you're aware of, based on some of the research you've done? Um, so it all kind of depends. I don't really have a cap on what partners I would like to have. I'd like to have as many as I can. Um, it's not just mental health right now. Mental health and substance use is our big focus. Um, so we have private practices out in Elma that I was able to partner with, some in Sweet Home that I was able to meet today through the coalition. Um, again, Horizons, Endeavor, they're within a very large radius. Um, when I do refer families, my big thing is insurance and transportation. Mm -hmm. How far do you want to drive? And what insurance do you have so I can make sure that this is as accessible and affordable as possible for you. Um, eventually, we would like to get um, to a point where it's not just mental health. You know, we can link with some colleges in the area like UB and Buff State, um, get some AP classes in for students, giving students an opportunity to venture out. Um, Erie County, getting linked with them as well. Um, with SPOA, RAP applications, those are government um, programs to help get extra resources specifically in the home. So families who might not be able to venture out can get those services in the home. Someone will come to them, provide those services at an affordable rate for them as well. Um, so there really is no cap. I would I would want to make it as big as possible and just make sure that we hit needs. Um, like you mentioned, it's, there's no blueprint. Um, so we're kind of just going. Um, but there really is nothing that I think could stop us from being able to grab all of these partners. Okay. Just a quick question. Um, thank you for all the work you've been doing since you started and getting this off the ground. But I did notice I do not see a link on the website for her information. I don't know if it's... It, so we're working on that. Okay. The website is something that's a work in progress. Okay. It's, um, we talked to Ken and you know, our team here about it. It's, it takes some training. Um, okay. She's building, we're building a website for her. Oh, okay. Links to our website. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. So the um, how just mailings out to the community so far, where can they find her contact information if somebody didn't receive it by the mailings that went home? Because there's not, I didn't see anything on the website. Well, I, um, I don't know if the, you know, we have linked the survey there, but I don't think we have a, we should probably put up a, just a, a, a place Shelf, for, yeah. for now, before yeah. the actual website is built. That's okay. a good point. Thanks. Um, just the one thing that I would like to ask, um, as you, you know, it's truly great seeing what you're building out, is that, you know, Julia, through, you know, Chris, or the superintendent, as you discover you need things, we can't promise, we can always give everything you need and want, but through them or, you know, let us know. I think this is extremely important, and we'd like to be, you know, kept informed, and, you know, Doug, probably, you know, in a, in a month or two, I'd really like them to come back and well, see, see, see what's... Yeah, you're, you're, yeah there's oh, schedule okay. three times this so, year. And just, and, and just let us know what you're thinking, what you're looking at. Like. So we can't, you know, promise, but it's something that's important to us, and we do want to hear, you know. Yeah, and to just jump into that, and I asked the, the question with partnerships, because the view that I have is you're one person, you can't do it all, right? The key to this family support center to be really functional is to bring the partnerships in. How you curate them, how you bring them in, what the radius is, you also need to be extremely focused. You can't say I can do it all, right? right. So I think it's very key as you go out there and start generating those partnerships and bringing them in. That's why I asked you what that total available partnership pool looked like. Mm -hmm. And then where our focus is based on current needs, because if one person from the district, doesn't matter if it's you or anybody, are trying to weasel those in and be able to get those into different people's uh, queue, I think it'll be really hard, but then that doesn't scale. So I think the, the, the perspective I have is I'm very interested as you're building this out, you're kind of just looking at it, the program has to scale and it has to be accessible. If it doesn't meet those two, 
then it's only one person doing a job. And so it's not going to be able to hit the larger community because if one person's managing it all, that's not, it's just not scalable. So very interested to see and, and have you come back and kind of see what those partnerships are because they have a lot more connections and I think can really help support. I think you're doing a great job and I think uh, the work you're doing is amazing and for the short period of time, I know what it's like to try to pull those in and, and get those relationships built. I'd say just keep going. Uh, real quick too, because you mentioned about getting it on the website. Yeah. If you actually look at our homepage website and you go under news and announcements, um, you do see your information is up there already. Just let you know because the link is still there for the survey, so that might be a spot where you yep. just stick it right in there because um, it's already a spot that's associated with it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome again, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please come back. <laughs> <laughs> is that like a violent invite? <laughs> <laughs> they will be. Um, You're doing well. Next. <laughs> next, we'll move on to uh, zero emission bus update. Uh, just a quick update. Um, I guess I'll start with just saying, I'll always start with this saying, there's been no timeline change by New York State for the implementation of zero emission buses at this point. Um, what we're going to do, our next step is uh, plan to meet with Wendell, a company that does architecture and engineering. Uh, they have been under contract with NYSERDA to do uh, transportation studies, transition plans, they call them. Um, we're going to have a discussion with them. Um, Keith will be involved, I think, as well. Um, and we're going to try and uh, implement a plan that's mostly, you know, majority funded by NYSERDA. Um, and it's something I think we're going to have to do if we want to be eligible for nicer to funding for buses down the road. New York State wants to make sure we're on a path to get the, you know, their timeline of 2027, 2035. Um, so this plan, we're going to talk to them and, and try and get uh, on this so we can uh, start everything going. That's it. That's it. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Next, we're going to move on to the regionalization update. Um, it was a uh, a meeting or a gathering that uh, the superintendent and I attended. Um, this one I'm going to try to be as um, brief as I can, but I do. This one, I, there's a lot to be said about. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give, you know, what I heard, what I saw, and my opinion. Um, so we all got together, and it, it started, it's, it, you know, it started off. It was kind of funny. The uh, BOCI superintendent got up there and said, you know, this is not what we're here to discuss, and this isn't the purpose of this, but there is money on the table for districts to merge. But we're not here to discuss that. Then they showed us how the overall, you know, student population enrollment has gone down in New York State, and then they reminded us that we spend more than any other state on education, and that we are 37th in graduation rates. Mm -hmm. So we weren't, but we weren't here to discuss that. So <laughs> then after that, we got on to the purpose of it was, in their words, was to share. District different, you know, district are sharing different things they have. And then they gave us a handout, um, which was supposed to guide our conversations. The, the, the number one thing on the handout, or what we were supposed to discuss, and they said the only thing that districts are mandated to do is have a discussion. But it was based on that every student in New York State had the same equity of opportunities. It wasn't defined. It wasn't saying like English, math, science. It was, that's how big and broad the, the topic was. Um, so my, my concerns start to be is that they kept saying, and this is the only time New York State has you know, opened this up to a local level for a decision like this. But they've opened it up with massive parameters, no guidance, no objective and what this should look like. And part of me goes, are they then going to say, well, you failed to do it, now we'll tell you how we want you to do it. They, they, there are districts out there, um, and, and Doug's had some you know, contact that you know, share concerns like that, but that is a concern that I share. As we were talking, there was, we began to discover there was, at least in our table, there was, we couldn't come up with a way to do this or to scale this. Um, and, and the one uh, superintendent, you know, said, well, you know, 
you know, to me, he goes, do you, so you're saying that, you know, zip code will matter in, you know, a kid's education? I'm like, it will. It, it has to. There's, there's no way that we can ever completely and totally eliminate that. Um, and then we, we talk some more. It's just, a, I think that it's a huge concern in what direction this goes in. It's something we have to watch. Um, New York State, you know, they do do some interesting things. Uh, we've seen it. I mean, not to be funny, but, you know, they had the case with the squirrel and the 10 D.C. officers, you know, that they raided to get the squirrel. Um, so I think it's huge that we have these conversations. You know, and then, you know, you know, I think it was a good point. I saw the superintendents, you know, immediately start to work. And, and Doug said, well, maybe the next meeting the board should be there. Where I disagree, superintendents are managers, and they like to get things done, and they want to find out, you know, how to do it. I want the board to continue to stay involved as, you know, should we do it? Should it be done? Is this in the best interest of, you know, our students? And what would it look like? I mean, does this mean that we, we bus kids from here to another district because they offer a different language? And then how do we get them back? You know, the superintendent offered a very good point. How do teachers view this? Um, and it was one of the number one, you know, mm -hmm. questions. I just think it's that big that we need to watch it. We need to stay involved in it. And it isn't that I am, you know, concerned about for our district. I think that New York is looking to reform, you know, education in a major way. And it may be in a way that we're not going to like. That's my opinion on it. I concur. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's the next? So, having said at that meeting, too, um, and I, like, I like to listen to things and listen to the story. And so when it came out for superintendents, how I really first heard about it is, hey, here's a survey you have to complete. We get it in the end of September, maybe early October. It has to be done by November 1st, and it's 50-some pages with reflection. And, you know, please complete it, and we're going to look at it, review it, and then put it on the next time you have to do this is in 10 years. Now when I listen to the, the conversations around it, it's, boy, this is a nice opportunity to take care of ideas that might come out of the Blue Ribbon Commission of how you can offer threads and opportunities to students. So it, it, it went from something to be self-reflective of what you can do better as a school using the data we sent them that they sent back to us and now we're regurgitating and putting it back into another form and sending back to them, um, so I don't quite get that piece, that we could look for over here for combining and making other offerings. And, and what I found interesting in Erie too which was at a superintendent's meeting, not this meeting, they said Erie 2 is very cooperative districts with each other of how we, if we're doing something and someone else wants to work with us, we let each other do it. And we take on that opportunity around. But there are things where it just doesn't work and we don't do it. We don't want to be in a situation where we're forced or told. We want to be selective in what we offer and responsive to our community. Um, so that's my little piece. I just just kind of want to just really quick, um, but there are, and just one question, uh, Doug, not to put you in the spot, but there are other districts out there that have gone further and sh have shared more concerns with their peoples on it and even the on board thing, which I think is just yeah. worth bringing up. So there is, there is a, a, it's actually not just one, but there's a group, and, and they're mainly from the other side of the state, um, that really look at this and, and they really have some anxiety around it or concerns and they've written a letter to the commissioner already. It's posted on their website. And why, why they have the great concern is the BOCI superintendents are saying, we're required to have the conversation, and that's as far as the requirements go. Well, how do you know this? SCD is telling us, and there's deputy commissioners right under the commissioner of education telling us this. Then the onboard magazine, um, in their September 23rd onboard online, which I know everyone gets these, so you can go back and check it. The state education department officials told on board that school districts will not be able to opt out of the discussions. Cool, that's the same message we're getting. Nor any local actions required by the regionalization plans developed by their BOCES district superintendent. Nowhere in here did it say a collaboration process for developing plans. BOCES say it is. Um, and it says you can't opt out of the regionalization plan developed by the BOCES superintendent. So SCD is verbally telling 
their representatives, which are the BOCE superintendents, one thing that they're telling us, yet they're being quoted saying something else. So is this a miscommunication, a misspeak, or is it an opening of the Pandora's box that they're saying what they're doing? Um, I brought this to the district superintendent, and I said I think there really needs to be some clarification because this is out there. Um, we're not the only, I'm not the only district doing that because I actually had a call across the state to get partners because I really don't seem to have any too many here, but uh, just to let you know. Thank you, Doug, for doing that. Any other? We'll keep you updated. <laughs> so, the, so what are, keeping us updated, but what's that look like? I mean, you've been through this before, right? Um, where the state comes back and is starting some high level initiative that doesn't look like anything and then all of a sudden it's something. So what what is the next piece of communication or timeline that we need to hit for understanding a little bit further? Great question because you know I've been through this before and usually you're kind of in the dark, kind of in the dark, and you watch the Board of Regents meeting and all of a sudden you go, holy cow, and, and you sit back and do this. Um, so that's my experience with it, which I don't think is an answer you wanted to hear. Um, where I will keep working on this is with the DS, is going to Albany to the different meetings, um, trying to meet with representatives there. And I have to admit, our, our DS, Dr. O'Rourke, is very good at having representatives from the state come to our superintendent meetings, what topics he gets to pick. But that's where I'll keep the pressure and keep trying to bring people together. Then as I hear something different or hear something the same thing, where they're repeating it, I'll keep bringing it back to the board, putting it in Friday memos. Every time I hear something, right now the deadline for November 1st was moved, I think, to December 1st or December 6th when we have to have this form done. I think getting feedback from that will be the next big thing. Um, when I say the feedback for that is what is going to be the BOCE superintendent's first discussions that they say everyone needs to be part of it and who will be at those conversations. I'll be at Erie too. We're a very far north district for it. Um, so if you were partnered with districts, you would say you would look south of us to stay in Erie too, but could we partner with other districts around us? And we do. We do share some sports and activities. We're in Erie too, but students, like um, they mentioned uh, New Visions tonight, the students, that's an Erie One program. So we do have partnerships like that, but I think it's us maintaining control of our district is what I have to keep an eye on, and if that starts to go sideways, and I think when you meet with anyone um, politically um, in political positions, you ask them what they know about it. What do you know about this? My answer is they're going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. So that's another piece of mine is to get out. Um, both, uh, there were just elections last night, so they were reelected for uh, the House of Rep or um, the Assembly and the Senate for the state. And so I will be talking to them. We do have regular meetings. They reach out to me. Um, we've had good partnerships just to keep them informed. But it's not coming from the legislative body or the governor. It's coming from the state education department that makes regulations and gives it to us. So it's, it's different. I just want them to know from the political aspect so they know. And um, just in closing, just to stress, like, you know, I've had, you know, my son graduate from here and my daughter's a senior this year, and they've had amazing educational experiences here at Iroquois and I just don't want to see that to be jeopardized for future students and I think it's something that we really need to pay attention to and then you know I don't want to steal Jane's thunder but this is one where you may need to contact your local representatives <laughs> and let them know because I, I think that we're not perfect but I know from my own students when you got local control you've got local feedback when you lose that you lose that, and then you got a bunch of people dictating to you what's going to happen with your children. And I think it's important to pay attention to it. I'm just sitting here thinking about so many different things. Um, I'm trying to picture how this would work um, when you start talking about, uh, you know, this school does this and this school does that. You know, like, are you talking about creating academies where this school has a a strength in, say, you know, drama, and so it becomes like the school, if you really want to be a drama student, you're going to ask to go to this school. It starts to sound like we're talking about school choices. Um, does that mean that then the district that is that student's home district 
are they still responsible for that student or, or is the other school that they've chosen to go to? How does that work with creating policy? You're, you're basically taking away, uh, you know, the control, the local control, like you're saying. Um, and I just, I can see this becoming an, a, you know, a, an increasing debate that then the state Depart education department will come in and say, oh, well, you guys can't do this, so we're going to do it for you, just like they did with some other things that we know about <laughs> in, in recent history. I'm just going to leave it there um, and have a conversation with our yeah. local assemblyman and senator. And, and I, I like the word partnership. I was just on a meeting this week with a bunch of Erie Two schools and um, some of the community colleges. And they're talking about partnerships and opportunities where you could take classes or, you know, this class, because some of them are smaller districts, could have a, like a biology class or, or, or some other one that students might be interested in. And that's where you could open up your schedule for this partnership without losing anything of your identity. A great example, the Visions program that we talked about tonight. That student said they're going to Buff State. That's a partnership. It's not a regionalization. Two very different things. And so what's the driving force behind this? Partnerships good, telling us what to do, bad. I think I just want to say one thing, and it's sort of understood, but it was more clear when you say it. I mean, the expectation I think we, we need to have is that you keep your finger on the pulse, right? It's nothing more than that because we can't change things, but we need to educate ourselves to understand what's going on that we can make the best decision for our students as Jim had said, and I got kids that have gone through Iroquois as well, I, I don't want to change that direction. Um, but without keeping our finger on the pulse and reaching out to legislation, we then tie our hands behind our backs ourselves. And I, I don't want to be in that position. So I, I think the expectation is to keep our finger on the pulse, and it starts with you, Doug, to kind of do that. And then also, as we can get involved, we can. I think also reaching out to NISBA, the school, New York State School Boards Association, and making sure it's on their pulse so when they're talking to the state education department, it's their conversation too. Um, and like I said, there's partners across the state, just more schools it would be the impotence. I think it's also important to understand how our, our, uh, how this, our board of regents uh, is formed. Um, those people are appointed by our legislators, right? Correct. So even if our legislators aren't really truly aware, <clears throat> excuse me, of what they're doing in terms of re regionalization and everything, uh, at some point we can hold our legislators accountable for what the state education department is doing because they're the ones that gave them the power to do it. Correct. Um, and so I at any given point they should conceivably be able to say we're going to change some people in, that leader in those leadership roles or change how that's working. Um, and if this sounds as bad as it does, hopefully our legislators will say, yeah, this doesn't sound great and this isn't what I want in my legislative district either. So and the only thing I want to mention there is, as bad as it sounds, it could be our minds just racing mm -hmm. and it could be something that's altruistic and good. And that's what we have to make sure it goes in the one direction, not where our minds can take it and be negative. Um, so we have to watch it. So I'll keep doing that. Okay, we'd like to move on to our discussion about the faculty roundtable. We, we have the date. That's February 14th. We just need to know exactly what form. Can you that date? Uh, February 13th? 13th, yep. 13th. Um, we need to settle on what the format's going to be. Um, and from, you know, my, you know, we've had a couple discussions from my point of view. Um, I would, you know, greatly want to see our administrators there. Um, and then I like the idea of, having the questions um, sent in ahead of time so we can have the answer. And it's important to me that when we're meeting with our faculty that there's things that are within the board's lane and there are things that are within the administrator's lane. And when that gets blurred, we tend to have problems. We do not, you know, I think Keith has spoken to this, you know, very well, that we do want them to, you know, during the meeting if they want to have other questions that maybe they didn't send to us, we you know, want to discuss being open to that, but I really think it's important that if we do this, that the administrators are there and it's an understanding of what our lane is. Um, there's a lot of things that come out that 
that are important, and they are truly important, but they're not within the lane of the Board of Education, and it's them coming to see us. Um, so that's you know, my thoughts about to get the conversation rolling. Are you asking the board if we want administrators? Well, I guess I'm asking the board, do we want the administrators there? And are we, do we settle on that the questions are going to come in ahead of time? Um, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it in your contract that you're supposed to be there? Yeah. So right there. I need meetings for the board meetings, my contract. To I, be there. I, I, I believe that um, at the very least our superintendent should be there. It's in his contract, and I think we should be honoring the contract. Um, we signed off on that, so I would say at the very least the superintendent needs to be there. Um, in terms of other administrators, um, I mean, I think there's value in them hearing feedback, but I think that they also have other avenues to get that, that feedback. Um, so I, I would I'm kind of neutral about whether anybody else should be there, but I do believe that the superintendent should be there. I kind of, <clears throat> I would agree with Jane um, with regards to the contract for Doug and then also administrators. I'm a bit agnostic, but I mean, I think if it's, um, it, it, I think it doesn't necessarily matter if other administrators are there or not. So if there's a comfort level and kind of going back to the reason why we're having the round tables is to get engagement with the faculty, understand what's going on, get some feedback, right? Um, you know, and, and to understand some of the pain points, but also understand that it's not our position to fix those pain points. But hearing it is important because it's feedback from the district. And so trying to make the format is easily, you know, understood for everybody, you know, and I think the questions early, I would agree with that, just kind of compiling them because oftentimes we found last year the same question was asked five different ways, right? And, and that's okay. Um, but we, we can, we, we sort of then spend a lot of time on a single question that keeps repeating versus going on to the next one. Because we want to be able to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. Um, but I also like the format of ha having, uh, I'll call it ad hoc questions where, hey, I just thought of this, I didn't submit it, I, I'd like to know your thoughts on X, right? But I also fully support Jim in the fact that, and as a board, we have to stay in our lanes, right? We, we're here for policy. We're here for financial oversight. We're also here for understanding and you know working directly with Doug. Those are our three sort of pillars of responsibility as a board. Now there's other pieces that kind of go into it, but um, functionally that's what we would be interested in. However, we also want to take the time out of our schedules to understand, hey, how is the community, how's the staff, how are the students feeling? And if there's something important, let's, I, you know, I want to have a little bit of that I will call it open door policy so people can come in and and share. So, and from my view, I mean, kind of, I, I would have Doug there, I, administrators, to me it wouldn't matter, questions ahead of time, and then also open that for, you know, questions if needed. I think the key, though, is to have it facilitated correctly, um, meaning making sure we have a structure to the conversations. Um, but I, I'm very open to listening to what, you know, Everybody has to say. And the one thing that I, you know, kind of want to stress is that, you know, students, uh, you know, and then after the students are equal to students, the, you know, the, the teachers and the faculty are amazingly important. Um, the students and the teachers go together. And the only thing I want to stress is that when a lot of times they, they will bring up things that are, that are important, um, but if it's out of our lane, I would just want, it's not, we, like you, listening to it's one thing, but it's not that we're ignoring them or we don't, you know, care. It's just that if, if it's not in our scope of responsibility, that it's not, we can't engage in that dialogue. Um, so I just don't want any, you know, teacher or faculty member to think that if we're not answering it, it's it's not because we don't care or we don't think it's important. It's just that it's a it's a question that would belong with administration or with HR, um, and ours is a little bit of a different scope. So I just. Because sometimes when you ask people, hey, come and tell me how you're feeling, what do you think is important, and they, they tell you what's important, but it's not something that you're able to deal with and you don't deal with it, it's like, well, I just came and told them what was important and they just didn't pay attention to me. I just want to avoid that. You know, because we support 
our students, our families, our administrators, and our teachers. And I think they're so important. I just don't want a teacher to ever feel that it's not that we don't care. It just may not be what we do. That's all. This is where my I'm just stressing. So does so it is, the, is the, are we good with at least having, you know, the superintendent there? We will get questions in, and maybe what the one decision we'll have to make is if there's a to your point, there's a bunch of questions that you know come in, and just in case I'm just making this, they would be in you know Dave's lane of expertise that maybe he would then attend that meeting to, if he got ten questions on. I don't know what the co-pays are for. That's a bad example, but we can kind of make it. We can kind of make that decision based on what those questions that, that come into. Okay. Uh, curiosity point of reference is: Are the questions going to be anonymous? I, actually, that's a question I was going to ask because what I'm hearing to mirror back is administration, their superintendent, if needed, others based on questions. Um, Sorry, I could get that down based on questions. And then the next thing I have questions ahead of time. Hand in question. Do you want them anonymous? Would you like names with them? Um, is there a particular, like we use forms there? It's um, We send that out to the teachers. Then we can compile it. Um, it's not just teachers, though. It's teachers and staff. So it, it would be anyone. Um, how would you like that? And then I think, would you want, uh, like, an ex explanation paragraph above of basically what you just said of very interested want to hear from you please send in the questions so we're not repetitive but please understand um, there are some things that are not the board's role to fix those points we have to stay within our scope of responsibility but if you come to the meeting to hear anything we talk about from the pre questions you could ask a question from the floor and I think it's absolutely essential that they're anonymous I think that's paramount that they're anonymous that would be, you know, I think it's. I yeah, we usually. Do I can't. I can't yeah, overstate how much it is that they need to be anonymous. Yeah, because we want. We want the the purpose of it is to get the feedback, right? It's not to make few people feel uncomfortable. But on the other hand, if they want to put their name, if they want to, that's fine too, right? It's whatever the individuals are comfortable with doing. Again, our purpose is to listen, to to get some feedback, to see what's going on, and what issues are coming up. Right, um, but to kind of touch on your point, I know we have to stay in our lane. We've been stressing that a lot. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want to hear the questions. Right. That's the, that has to be very clear because I do not. It doesn't mean that well, it's not about policy or, or finances. So that I'm going to not ask that. No, we we want to hear the feedback because that's the purpose of the roundtables. If we don't answer, it's not because we don't care, just because it's not what we do, and that's stress. I just want anyone to. Feel that we would be like, eh, yeah, like you said, matter thing. I just think having that's I, and that's basically what I was trying to get to with. Here's a paragraph of what it is. Here's part of that is what to expect, and that way when they read it, do the survey, they already pre know what the meeting would be. So they may come to it, they may not, because if they send in their question, they may say, well, they know my question. I know it's not in the board's lane, but they know to use your word, my pain point, and. Um, or not pain point because there, 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 there's a lot of positive things teachers do and are part of around here so they might be putting those, some of those positives in there too um, so that would be something we just have to develop I would I would take a stab at it bring it back to the board the board would have yeah. to review it and then when they're comfortable with the survey and the format then we'd have to determine the amount of time to send it out ahead of time um, good news is we're talking about February 13th so we do have a few months um, I, I'm thinking about something that we're doing with our uh, at ECASB with our legislative breakfast. M m this format might work really well here, and that is where um, their comments could be where they um, present us with either the problem or the celebration that they want to share with us, and then they give us an example, and then they give us their ask, whether it's that they want their celebration to be more public or that they want their problem addressed in a certain way or who they would like to have feedback from um, so that it gives us a little bit more structure. So you've got your, your problem or celebration, your um, example of it, and then what your ask is. That might make it a little bit easier to handle too. Because I don't know what they're really asking for. 
And it's not just a, we want you to hear us uh, tell you all the problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people, like I just had a meeting with the fourth graders, they, they do have solutions for it. Sometimes there are solutions we can't do for multiple reasons, but then you can try to know the direction you're going, so then you can try to provide some relief. And, and by having that piece of what is your ask and, and who are you asking, it kind of gives them the ability to step back and say, okay, what is it that I really want? Is it that I want the board to look at adding more funding to this so that mm -hmm. our administrators can support us? Or is it that I really want our, our administrators to do something? And that they, it kind of helps them see the different roles the, that everybody in the district has, too. Yeah, because if they say, well, we, you know, an easy example would be, well, we need more staffing to do this. Well, that's a funding thing, which does come right back to the board during budget things, but then they also, what's the reality of the situation when we're discussing it during budget time? I wrote down from what you said, problem or celebration, example, then solution. And I think, Doug, having you there also will be able to answer the question, right? Because it's either the board or you. So, I mean, Sometimes I, I need support from administrators. Agreed, so agreed. But it, <laughs> but it kind of like, you know, when, when, when people are asking questions, though, I mean, you, you can't get... That's why I feel the questions ahead of time will help because yes. then yeah. you'll, you'll questions ahead of time I can go out and see because you'll notice that something that you need yeah. a particular you may need a particular administrator there. Yeah, and that's why we can look at the questions ahead of time um, and determine who would be needed there. Okay. Um. So uh, it seems like we've got that um, moving. We're next going to move on to the student board member, and Jane is going to. Uh, well, can I do a quick refresher of something? Yeah, yes. So a quick refresher of it, and this was from, uh, you didn't get it because it's from the Council of School Superintendents. Governor signs legislation requires student board members. Points to remember, at least one student representative on their board will not be permitted to vote or participate in executive sessions. Establish the process for selecting the student board member. You have choices. Elect elected student president of high school, so the president of the student body government would be on it automatic, selected by high school student government, so the government picks who they want, selected by the high school principal, selected by the superintendent, or selected by a majority vote of the school board. So those are possible avenues for selecting it. Um, the person has to be in the high school for at least one year, and it goes into effect September 25th, and we do not provide transportation. Um, that's not a requirement for the student. They would have to provide their transportation to get here. September 25th of 2025? 2025, yes. So we have to have it in place so for September of next year. I, I brought this up as a, when uh, Jim reached out and said, what, you know, what do board members want to see on our agenda? I brought this up um, because I had just... Um, attended a session at the NISBA convention um, about empowering student voices. And while that session did not end up being what I thought it was going to be about, um, <laughs> I did have some really great conversations with all of the women sitting around me um, about this, I because they all felt the same way. This isn't what I thought it was going to be about. Um, but uh, it was amazing to hear the, the many different ways that districts that currently have students on their board um, have handled that and they're looking at do we get to keep handling it the same way or do we have to change it now because of these rules um, from what you just said it sounds like they don't have to but I, I got some really good um, ideas and I was like this is something that's going to take us some time to do uh, we this needs to be on our agenda and on our radar now because we're going to have to spend some time talking about how do we want to um, incorporate a student on our board and what is that the role of that student going to really look like. Um, I've gone to several different local boards um, in, in my role with ECASB, and some of those boards do have students you know, on them already, and it seems like the student just sort of sits there and twiddles their thumb, and then when it comes time to do the student report, they report out what's going on you know, in the district for students, mostly the high school. And I thought, that's not what I want to see our student mm -hmm. board member be. I want our student board member to be, you know, a, a strong voice and an advocate for students. Um, and I also love having different reports from different groups and different organizations throughout the middle school and the high school 
uh, and I love having our elementary students come in and lead the pledge. I don't want to see that change. So these are the kinds of conversations that we, we really need to look at this and see what we want to do. But one of the things that I really, really loved from, from one lady downstate, um, their board has it set up so that they know who their board member is going to be come July, and that board member takes their seat in July with the rest, with anybody who's newly elected, um, and it's a senior. And then they also have a junior, and the junior is the sits in the audience, doesn't sit at the table, but is there as the backup. So if the senior can't be there, the junior takes takes the seat, um, and then that junior automatically becomes the person when the junior moves up to the senior, and the, and then you're always looking for a junior to take the junior seat. And I really thought that that was kind of a cool way of doing it because then you have. Um, a little bit more consistency, and that student is really getting a true board experience. They're, on the, they're technically on the board for two years, one year in the audience and one year at the table. Um, and you've got, you know, um, ECSB is talking about um, what we can do to support school districts in, as they incorporate students into their board, and we've, we've been kicking around different ideas about creating a training for them so that they learn about governance and finance so they understand what a board member's role is. Um, but there's so many different ways that districts can handle it that, you know, we don't want to step on policy and how each district does it, but to come up with some central ideas for um, things that we can do to help support districts creating this new role. Um, I, I just thought that there's, there's so much we have to decide how we want to have our board member our student board member um, brought into our board. Are we choosing it? Are, are we letting the principal choose it or the superintendent? Or, these are conversations that we need to have so that we can start planning it out. And yes, it's it, it's not required until September, but wouldn't it be great if we had our program set up so that the student can start in July with us and be mm -hmm. at uh, the district planning? Um, and, and I just want to add in one thing there. I think that's definitely you, you have to, and I think one thing you have to look at, um, with even what that one person was saying, because I think it's a neat idea. None of you have people that step in in case you're not here. So if they're a member of the board, are they allowed to have that opportunity if they're not here for someone to come up? We just have to, if that's something the board wants, I'd have to look into the legality of it, because it says representative on the board. So you have one on the board, but you have a spare. Is that legal? I don't. I well, personally wouldn't have a problem with it. I think it's a great idea. When you think about it, like, like there are rules in place. If we miss more than three meetings unexcused, we can be removed from the board. You don't want to interrupt a student experience. Like they're, first and foremost, their job is to be a student. A student. And if right. you're talking about a senior, we have a board meeting on the night when it's their senior night of their sport thing, or they're, they're trying to get, uh, they have, National Honor Society inductions or something. You know, you don't want to take away from their student experience mm -hmm. because they're on the on the board. Yeah. Um, so I don't. Know that, but it's so that's that was their thinking behind it. I didn't think about the fact that we don't have somebody who backs us up. But and that's why I think that's you, a good point. You talk to other schools, come up with your idea. I think the first thing, and the easiest one is, how do you want to get the person on the board? Because once you get the person on the board, if you were to pick. You know, it's the student who has been duly elected by the student, elected by student as student president. Then is it the president and the vice president, but the vice president might be two seniors rather than a senior and junior. And then the junior, if it's the vice president, might not be the president the next year. Right. So then that chain of command. So you really I think the first is you how you any, want the person. Have you had any conversations with your student cabinet about this? No, no, we Maybe haven't got to it yet. I, you know, I mean, like, we're talking about students. <laughs> Let the students have a voice in it. Oh, yes. Okay. With, you know. And the I thing that, go ahead. I would even say go to, like, the biz, whoever is running the business education portion right now and see if there's anybody who wants to get into like business management and that so they can get into the budgets and all that and kind of see it and what they're looking to step into just like we just saw with the you know the kids going to buff state let well, them get a little back to how do we want the person right. to come in do we want but someone so the the principal <clears throat> could ask anyone who's interested please let us know and then we have a criteria well if you're going into as a profession business boom you're picked first or is there an interview by the board then oh uh, i would I would just say the I think that the way this has 
value. And I think the only way it has value is that this individual brings the student perspective to us. I would not want the superintendent to pick it. I would not want administrators to pick them. Mm -hmm. I would certainly not think the board should pick the individual. I think the students need to pick the individual. Because if, if they're not bringing what they think is important to them and to students, then they really have no value. Because their voice is letting us know what the students think. So, I mean, I would be okay, like, if it's a general election, or if you tie it in with SGB, that's fine. But I think it's got to come from the students, because that's the value. And then to parallel what Todd was saying, you, you could actually have, when they elect a student government body, that's a position, so people are looking for that field, could put their names in and say, I would like to run for this. Well, and it's going to teach kids about the election process one more step, right? Mm -hmm. so. I think that's the way I would look at it. I would almost do what Doug and Todd said, that at part of the student government, this is just another position, you know, they can that they can run for. Well, and this is this is where, you know, one of the ladies that I spoke to at, at the convention said that they, when they decided to implement this, their student government does, in that case, their student government does elect their person, and their student government had to change something in their bylaws to allow it to be somebody who would hold two positions, because their bylaws said they could only hold one position at a time. So again, we need to have these conversations because if our student government has bylaws that they're following and, and we're asking them to do something that goes against their bylaws, they may have to change their bylaws. Well, I guess that's another question. Would you want someone who holds two positions? So I am the treasurer and the board representative, or do you want to make it so that you hold one position and you would have to pick? I'm running for this position or I'm running for that? <coughs> That's how I view it, because it's the closest to what the reality is. As a parent, one, because holy smokes, do I drive in the school a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the next thing is, um, you know, we can talk about, you know, how we want, think it should be picked, and then an information gathering. Like this, you know, yeah, I mean, I'll ask, I, have a, I always have a student cabinet meeting before the board meeting, so I can ask that, give you your feedback, and... You, you see kind of what's open for that. If I review them again, it's elected by the st as student president, elected by the high school student government, um, principal, superintendent, or by the board. I think watching people's head, the board picking it, the superintendent picking it, or the principal picking it are out. Oh. So you're kind of like, how do you want it done by the student body? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I'll bring feedback back to the Okay. board and you guys can think about one position, two positions, just the president. I mean, and I, so when, you, when you talk to the students, I, I bet they have lots of ideas that you know, will be viable. Well, they'll have one, it'll be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, you know. Yeah, so they will. They'll just. Well, they're with a good you group. going to the student cabinet, and, and hopefully there's some students out there listening who are saying, oh, I really want to do that, um, you know, it'll start that conversation. That conversation needs to be had. And, and again, Part of our conversation needs to be, do we want the student to start in July, or do we want to start it in September um, when, when the requirement starts? Uh, and do you like the idea of having that, that backup and knowing who it's going to be so the person actually has a two-year experience with the board? And like looking at idea. Jane, put another idea in my head. What happens if no one in the student body, it's an elected position, no one runs for it? Do you have a write-in? Ooh. Hey, <laughs> now wait a minute. <laughs> but, I mean, that's something that could happen. You, you could have a year where people aren't interested in it for whatever reason. I actually brought that up in the group of ladies that I was talking to, and they, they kind of laughed at me, and they said, no, there's always a student who yeah. wants it on the resume. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. the, the there's always someone who wants it until Harvard, they don't want it, and you don't have a, Yale, don't have a process, yeah. you're in trouble. The, there's, there's always going to be a student. They said that that is not a problem. There's always a student that wants it. Um, part of me was like, what happens if the student body elects a kid you know, like nominates an Alexa kid uh, as a joke, but and they said, don't worry about that either. It's not. And even if they you know, did, they have to put their name. In. I mean, that easily yeah. you have mm -hmm. to put your name, and you can't run for it unless you put your name. Right. In. And that starts oh. with that starts with elections have consequences, and that's what we're trying to teach them. So if they elect a, if they elect someone as a joke, well, they just would give up a lot of you know representation. Mm -hmm. I think part of this is an educational experience too. 
Mm -hmm. But you know, once we determine how we're going to get this person on the board, then it's the next step is how do we onboard them and what is it that we really want them to do in their participation. I really don't want a student who just sits here and then says, well, so we had homecoming and, and this great dance and the team won and yay and, you know, I, I'd like to see I think that, in my opinion, is the actually like any one of you that's out here, they just can't vote. They give their opinion, they make yep. their comments, mm -hmm. yeah. we listen yeah. to them, unfortunately they can't vote. So I, I, I went to a, a local meeting and, the, and it was the first time I heard a student speak aside from their report where the, the board was talking about um, testing. Uh, and the student jumped right in and said, well, let me tell you about the testing. <laughs> and, and he shared that um, he didn't know that the test, the standardized test meant anything. And so he just went, check, 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 check. And the next thing he knows, he goes into ninth grade um, in, a, in a program where he has to get extra help because he didn't take the test seriously. And it, it took them about three months to retest him to prove that he didn't need to be in AIS services. Um, and he said, students don't understand that. And it was really kind of eye-opening to see that student perspective at, and I, that's where I first started going, oh, this is, we got to think about how we want our students to be on our board. Um, and I would think they could put things on the agenda, too, under board discussion. Hmm? Yeah. Sure. So, uh, it, so that's, that, that's another piece of the conversation once we, once we get our students. What, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> um, and uh, just stuff for you to start thinking about so we can have these conversations um, mm -hmm. in the future. Well, with that example, it'll actually help us to sharpen our pencil in the middle school and get the kids prepped and they actually will make it a better experience and district. It's a good one. And that's the overriding point. It only has value if we get what they think and what they need. And so often I'll, I'll see a board with a, with a student on it and the board members are just doing the board meeting and the student's just sitting there. And even if they look even remotely interested, nobody's paying attention to them. So I want to make sure that, that you know, mm -hmm. we make our student board experience Super positive and, and productive. That, that 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 student gets something out of it, and that our student population gets something mm -hmm. at, at, by having that representation on the board. That's the whole point of it. You know, uh, I think it was like maybe two years ago the board talked about adding a student to our our board, and we decided as a as a board that we didn't want to do that because we were getting the student experience from our reports and. Uh, I, I still think that we should have those reports. I don't think that the student on the board should stop those reports. Just throw it in my two cents. I think we generally agree. Um, we're we're going to move on to um, 606, the capital project spending limit discussion. And this is designed to be very narrow in scope. Um, what I was looking for is really kind of simple, is as a board, you know, and I know there's going to be some plus or minus, but if we're using $20 million as a benchmark because there's no tax impact or additional tax impact after that, or are we willing to go over the $20 million, which would result in, in a tax impact? That is the, the nuts and bolts of this discussion. Where are, we at, where are we on that? And to take a quick stroke poll, because then once we've established that, then I think that ourselves and the architect and the administration can go back and look at what projects are the the most important but if you remember it ranges from nothing to 107 million dollars and that's a massive span of numbers so you know I you know I in our district I think that you know fiscal responsibility has always been a, been a hallmark uh, so I think that you know just with Sticking around the twenty million, or not having a tax in cap, is extremely important to our district. But that's my thought. I would like to, you know, what my fellow board members feel, so we can have more discussions later. So I'm I'm going to jump in, and I, I agree with the conversation. And what I would say is, I actually am not going to put a number to it because I don't know what the number is. I don't know if it's twenty. I don't know if it's twenty-one. I don't know what it is. My my view is no tax impact, right? And you fit as much as you can under that umbrella, right? Because when I looked at the individual numbers and dug through them, there's really only three things that that would equate to is roofs and heating and some ancillary pieces probably to help the district, right? Um, those are the big ones. And so I, I would say 
you know, as you're talking about a straw poll, like, hey, what's that look like? I'm just going to say it's, it has to have no tax impact. That's that's my point of view. Yeah. And just let the board know, when he was saying $20 million, that's what I was hearing. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah exactly. I didn't know For the public, number. too? Yeah. Whatever number it is, no tax impact. If it's 19, 18, 20, 21, 22, what you can do with no tax impact is what I'm hearing. Yes, I concur. I think it's, it's tough. I understand the no tax impact, but there's a lot of repairs that need to happen. And what is the impact of kicking that can down the road? You know. It, so. Well, I mean, with 20 million, are we going to miss anything? Yeah. That is an, it's a must that we really shouldn't neglect. And just to go, just to go back, I, I, this is my fault. I don't want to use the 20 million number. I want to use what Keith said. Well, we just, just, <laughs> just, yeah. but just, Jesus, we're right. just going to use it, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For right. I, I, would just, a, whatever. I would actually go, having been in this position for a while, mm -hmm. let's not use 20. Let's just say no. the maximum. Um, because otherwise the public will hear 20 million. If we go out with 20.5, they'll say, oh, look, there's tax impact. There's a 0.5. So let's just say the maximum, if that's okay with the board. Um, or, or, the, or, the, or the maximum with no tax, probably even clearer to the public. So is there anything we would miss with that? Um, I would have to go back and look at that list, and I'm sure there's yeah, maybe some parts really of a roof that are getting towards their end. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say yes, because like if we were to do the heating systems, and I'll look out there, because I think Marilla's in a steam system stuff, because you have the one room where the artist is baking, right? Okay, good, I got that right. And Wales is the same way. So you do those, and, and the roof at Merle is good, but I think the roof at Wales needs to be done. That leaves the HAV units, HAVC units at the high school that are working, but they break, and we really have a tough time getting parts for them that are still there, but they're working. So they are at the end of their life, and the $20 million would not cover that. Or, sorry, I said it. Sorry. The max, max, the max, the max, the max, max, max amount with no tax <laughs> limit. All right. See? Ah. All right. So I'm really going to test your memory. What would be the deficiency between them? I know you're going to shoot me. If I'm going to use 20 as the yeah. example. How much more would we need in the project to cover those? Correct. I would. I. I. I sorry, I did not bring that one form with me. I probably yeah, brought I know, the mouse for the, yeah. for the limits and what they would do. But that could be. Um, I'm guessing 3.5, 4. I, I would, uh, if you have it, I could look at it quickly. No, I thought I might. Um, yeah. so, I, I mean, we, it, it's kind of like your house. I mean, everything's going to fall in if you don't take care, care of it. So we've got to make sure that we're at least taking care of things so we're not going to cost more money in the because we've run, kicked yeah. it down the road. Mm -hmm. it, so that's, that's a very interesting question. Anytime you kick something down the road, cost escalation, it will cost more money. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a few things that might come down, but overall, if you wait five years to buy something, it's going to be more expensive. Think of a pair of sneakers, what they used to cost five years ago, what they cost now, because people buy a lot of sneakers. Um, so those items will cost more, but on the same token, will there be changes, uh, developments that will make what we put in there better? Um, so, so then you do get some quality there. Uh, you know, we do about a project every five to seven years. So we do have another opportunity coming up with that. Would they last that five or seven? I think they could. Would some break and they have to be replaced in the meantime? Yes, and oh, that's, right. but that happens with anything. I mean, there's a little piece of molding that fell off over there that John pointed out to me today. It fell off. All the rest is doing good. It, you know, that needs to be fixed. Um, you know, so would, would there be other things the district would like to do? Absolutely for the heating. It wouldn't be anything opulent or making things fancier. But if, you know, would people want to spend for, you know, if, if it's a $10 million more, the price was $22 if your house was $200,000 $200, for what you would sell it for, not 
to the public, not what is equalized Mar for market value. It's yeah. eleven dollars per hundred thousand. Yeah, I I did some looking at the uh, survey. Uh, what we looked at at mm -hmm. budget meeting last Monday, again today, and um, I came to the sad conclusion that that we are not going to be able to do the things that absolutely need to be done and stay under the camp, right. the, the max, the max. Yeah. Um, but I also have confidence in this community that when it comes to upkeep of our buildings and, and and as you said you know if you don't do this it's gonna be bad further down this community understands that we're not asking for you know these we're not asking you to put a dome uh, no. on, on the uh, stadium across the street we're, we're asking for not leaking roofs um, and I think this community understands that um, and I, I have to have faith that if we need to go over the maximum um, as long as we are responsible about it and not asking for too much. Um, I, I, I really think that it, it might be time to ask them to do that. When do we find out what the actual budget is that we're going to get? We determine. You the ninth, like the 20 and the 19? Yeah, yeah. We're we, okay. we determine that, okay. that number um, as a board. You know, so in other words, we did, because the, the, we're basically then our neighbors and our friends how much money are we going to take from them? That's us determining that amount. I, I, I guess to, to wrap up what I'm saying, my goal is always to stay under that cap so that there's no impact. But I, I do believe that if we have to go above it, I don't want to go to the full $46 million that priority one. <laughs> but I think that if we need to go above it, you know, by saying, what, I think it was like 10 million. If, if, we, could, if, we, could, if we could go over it by ten million, um, so that the impact is minimal, um, I, I think that our community would support that to have good roofs and heating. So I, I'm willing to entertain going over it, just not. So I just pulled off the high school numbers quick because Jim had that document with them. Three things in there was roof and then the HAVAC system. Um, the HAVAC system also has the DDC control, the units that control it, you know, on the side, the therm thermostats. Um, to do the HAVAC system was 3.8. Um, I, I hadn't thought of the DDC, so I was pretty close there with the 3.5. The DDC would be about 1.6. These are millions. The roof would be about 4.4 million when I kind of put them all together. Roughly, quickly off the top of that and doing some estimates, it's about $10.1 million. But that's not including your cost above, escalations Above what the amount of no tax impact. That would be including the escalation. Okay. If, if you were to put it, if you were to do, you know, we have to go back and refine the numbers and add them all together, but if we were looking at heating systems in the two elementaries, um, the roof in one, and then doing the high school, I'm guessing that would be around $30 million total. Uh, from what the estimates were given there. We'd have to definitely go refine those to make sure I'm right, because please know I picked up my phone, I <laughs> did a few numbers here, did a few prior percentages for escalation, um, so I could be off. But if that's what you're looking at, we could, we could give that price and break it out with the heating work at the two elementaries, the roof at the one, and then the roof and the heating system at the high school and scope it way down to that and get a cost really quickly. And not not just you know construction costs, but all the other incidentals that would go with it. What's that? I, I just think, I, I, like Tim said, our hallmark is being fiscally responsible, and I think that at some point you have to say to the taxpayer, we understand you don't want to pay more taxes, but you, we also need to keep our building in good condition. And yeah. If we need new roofs, if we need new HVAC systems. We and, well, it's just going to get worse. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, just really also sensitive to remember this. If we if we do this, it's also in addition to the normal operational budget that goes up. So they'd get the you would have the tax increase for the operational budget that went up, and this would be on, on top of that. Um, and it's impossible to say what's a an insignificant or significant amount to any individual. 
everyone's different. And that's what we wrestle with. And this is the hallmark as a board, what we do, because these are our neighbors and, and our friends. Um, and so this is the exact conversation I wanted to have. Where are we at this? It's not an easy conversation, nor should it be an easy conversation. Uh, the last time we asked them or the last time it was approved? That it happened. That it was actually done. That it was actually passed? Never. Um, we did ask them when we were talking about the two propositions for the fields. Um, when we had the proposition over there, and I want to say back in 2007, 2008, there was a large, I'll say $50 million project that went down. We ended up doing like a $15 million project from that. But have we ever, since my time being here, done a project that had a tax impact? Never. And I am just, I am cautiously and very guarded that that is something that we have done. Um, and our community, in a lot of stuff I read, they trust the board and they trust the administration because we act super, you know, responsible and fiscally, you know, conservative. Um, so I just want to, you know, stress that. Um, I think that, you know, I, and I think the difference is what we got to understand is, to, you know, kind of to Doug's point that amounts sometimes become irrelevant. The principle of that, you know, you're taking more money for your operation budget. Now you want even more money. Could have, you know, we've never, like Doug said, we've never done it. This, the one time the district tried, it was voted down. Um, so I just think, you know, I'm, I am hypersensitive to that, and I am hyper concerned, concerned about that. I mean, we could do. I mean, you could do a split proposition, but I was going to. I was just going to say, is it possible to to create um, a two proposition thing, one where the, there's no tax impact, and then uh, determine maybe it's the high school things that are that would be the tax impact. Make that a second proposition. And, and then that way we could still get some things done. And if the public really doesn't want to have that impact, you know, the roof isn't as, as, as important as the impact on their taxes, they can say no to it. And then we just don't do that part of the project. Yeah, what you could do is you could have the proposition one being the amount with no tax impact. And you design the scope that proposition two would add $10 million to the project to cover these pieces and then what I would do is work with, with the team and prioritize and proposition one with no tax impact. The things that, you know, prioritize that these need to be addressed first, these need to be addressed next, and that's not to say that it's a next, it's they will be done, it's just whether you do it today or you let cost escalation drive those prices up which will cost taxpayers even more in the future. Um, uh, well. I mean, sometimes being fiscally responsible is spending money, right? Because if we're just keep on throwing money at bad HVAC units, we're just throwing good money over bad. Right. So, um, I mean, I'm not looking to spend money, yeah. but I think making two propositions so people can actually see why we're asking for 33 more dollars in most instances per household around here, why we're asking for that 33 bucks. And one of the things I sit on is for the insurance reciprocal that we're part of. I sit on the board for that. And one of the things they, we, they talk about annually, and they're talking about now, the type of year it's starting to turn freezing, is if one of the HAVAC or, or one of the, the units in the classrooms freezes up and a pipe breaks and you have water leaking throughout your district for a weekend, for a vacation, the amount of damage and the impact to instruction now, granted, the amount of damage, some of that's covered by insurance, but the impact to instruction, because you can't use those rooms. They're, they're, you know, think of water running. There's videos on TV if you want to watch it, where if you go away in your house, a faucet's left on and runs for a weekend. How much damage is done in, your, in the house to drywalls, flooring, everything. So now it's running through the whole school, pooling, going under rooms. Um, at Wales, we had to actually rip out a wall this summer. You guys were informed of that because of where a pipe was plugging up from the roof. Um, we had to rip out a wall. Think of the expense of that. I'm, I'm willing, you know, from my point of view, just for me, I, I think the two proposition idea has a lot of value. Um, and I would definitely think that's something that I'd like to see. I'm going to channel my inner Keith here. If we do that, 
if we do that, the communication is going to have to be exceptional from us and this district because if people don't understand, right. they vote no. So I'm willing to do the two propositions and support that, but I, I just want to make sure that us and the administration, the communication is outstanding. And right. if there's plenty of, so the public understands what we're doing and why. And why the only thing I would say is before we say we're going to do it and support it, let's get the numbers, get the yeah. scope to you. Yeah. Um, okay. Just you know, just so the public can hear. Oh, Jim's already well, no, supporting it. Yeah. We haven't looked at it. Well, yeah, it's a, you know, it's, well, yes, to support the idea. The support the yeah. idea. I wasn't yeah. looking at it. For and this was like a straw poll, just so we. The point is, how do you eat an elephant one piece at a time? When we sat down on the 28th, that was an elephant. It, to think if we we're going to go line by line and come up with something, no. you never would. And this was to refine that process so we could mm -hmm. come up with a, a plan. So what I'm hearing is we'll scale it down. Do you want to do it at the next board meeting, or do you want to have a schedule a work session to look at it? I think if you scale it down that far, you could almost do it at a work session. Um, I'm sorry, at a board meeting, if you scale it down. I think we far. could do that one at a board meeting. I, okay. I think we could. One thing I want to make, because because Todd, you were touching on it, and I do think it's extremely important. We can sit here and justify anything, right? And we can say it's going to cost more money down the road, so we need to do it today. The ask that we should have for Doug is you need to get as much under that as possible. Mm -hmm. Where those ancillary items or those items that equate to the five or ten million are a little bit of an easier decision. Because my focus is, you know, keeping the kids dry and keeping them warm. warm. Right. right? Like, I mean, that's, you know, because you look at the list of 106 million at, or the 46 million or whatever the num number is, I look through it very clearly and I'm like, it's just a lot and it becomes exhausting. So I think we can justify anything. Should we spend it? Should we not? Um, but I'd like to see back from Doug kind of those quote unquote must haves. Mm -hmm. But even in those building reports, there's a little subjectivity in there. Let's be honest, right? Oh, and yeah. we need to understand that where the building says, yeah, we need to do this because it needs to be replaced. Nobody's refuting it, but they're not going to stand behind it could last another five years. So we take a little bit of a gamble on that. Knowing that and understanding that, I want to be fiscally responsible for the community to come in and say, we got as much done as we can under budget. Here's another opportunity if that's, if that's the direction. I'm, I'm not decided yet, but if that's the direction we decide to take and here's this other bucket that we want to do. But let me be clear, that other bucket has to be important enough right. to move the needle. And that's what I want. That I don't have that information today, but that's the information I'd be looking for next board meeting to say, okay, what kind of resides in that bucket and what level of priority can the board put on it? And, and do we stand behind actually giving it to the vote? Because I don't want to bring anything to the community that we're going to fail. No, and I'm, my point is, like, what's a fire and what's just, you know, hanging out? Watching the stars, right? The stuff that's on fire, we got to pay attention to. Yeah. The other stuff, uh, you know, and not, I, I don't play tennis, it's, but you know, uh, I like what you said. <laughs> the fire on the star, never. Heard well, right, that's good. But yep. like that tennis court, I was like looking at it. I'm like, all right, what's under it right now? Can we just resurface it? Do we have to put 18 inches of stone? Is there 18 inches of stone currently under? Because if there is, why aren't we just peeling the top and repaving it? Or can we just pave over it, resurface it? There, there's a lot more to unpack. To be, you know, Keith's point, than just holy hell, we need to spend this much yeah. money for a tennis court. Well, yeah. Some of those particular items, and I'm glad you brought that up, and that's where I actually trust Doug quite a bit with some of his capital projects and what he's done and how he's made decisions. Now, not everybody knows it or sees it, but behind the scenes, he can actually define okay, this is what we want to do at this time, include this, not include this, to make the money go as far as we can, right? That's my expectation also. Right? It's kind of, again, a little bit behind the scenes. If you watch the last board meeting, it was questions I asked. Okay, what's your process? Right, You go in there and we give you this budget and then how is that budget managed? Because the key actually is managing the budget. It's not really the number because you want to get as much in it as possible. And then how do you stage those pieces? So that's the expectation and that's not always clear. But you know, I think that's what it is. So when you look at, I'll say the tennis court as your example, how much do we need to do to make it right, right? We don't need to tear it out and rebuild it. Do we, you know, what are the pieces we need to do? And, and I think Doug's looking at it as, here's my estimate, and then I'm gonna look at the estimate and see, do I really need all this, right? <laughs> and, and so I think, and, and that's the ask, I think, for, for our next board meeting. Yeah. Do we need all of this, right? What, we kind of have a level, and how, how do we get as much into that bucket as possible? 
Yeah, and, and, I, and, and, and you say Doug, but I, I really have to give a lot of credit um, to our architect, but even more to, to Dave Carlin and his crew out in, in maintenance. Because to use your tennis court, that's a great example, because we actually did that. We talked about, because this summer we'll be resurfacing the drive over by the old football field. We did studies, we did bore samples, we know what's under it, but then we also looked at, well, how long has that been there and how's it done, so how stable is it? And we're just milling the top off of it because now they have a, I'll call it an airport grade blacktop that they're putting down. And we're going to put that down and leave what's under there because that's been very stable because then also if we ever change this, this, or this, we're not ripping up work we just did, which allowed us to do that work because remember I said it went up so far just about here, but saving that money allowed us to finish up to the high school now. And that's exactly what we do with everything, and that, that crew is great with it. Um, they even look at it as such as, well, if we buy the materials under the capital project, we'll get those with aid, but it's pretty easy to put those in. We can do that ourselves. So if you looked out the fire column, you see an in-house column of millions of dollars that our crew does here. They deserve a lot of credit for taking on that sure. and constantly doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where, that's where, you know, and Dave does live in the community, so I, it's his money too, so I know yeah. he's watching that and taking care of it. So we'll get that together, get the pieces. Our architect lives in the community. His tax dollars do too, so we're all looking at that, and, and we'll get that together. We, we kind of have a rough dollar scope, a rough scope of the work we're looking to do, and we'll see where we get with the dollars with that, and we'll get that prioritized out. Because they might say, well, the roof of the high school is a higher priority than any other roof. Um, so, you know, please, when I said that, it was just right. kind of right. my mind. And, yeah. and that was the, you know, this was a very limited scope of this conversation. And I want to, you know, thank all my fellow board members for, you know, coming together and working through it and just getting some direction. I just knew that this survey by itself and having another work session going through line by line wasn't going to be fruitful because there was just, it was just too much. And so, you know, I think everyone is very valuable in narrowing the, the scope. And now we have some, that's what it is. Now we have some solid ideas to move forward with. So, yes, and that's what I mean. I can support the collecting these ideas and getting back. And we can just now move the ball to the next step. And your ball now, Doug. All right. John, get it done. <laughs> okay, it's John's ball. <laughs> Send it over to Dave, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A new job for you, Dave. <laughs> Wrong way, John. Move the decimal point the other way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Now we're going to do the next uh, 6.07, which is the update on the uh, NISBA conference for the people who went to it. So, <laughs> um, I, we're getting close to 9 o'clock, so I'm not going to say a whole lot, but just to say that it was a really valuable experience. I was able to network, obviously. Um, with a, a lot of different people on a lot of different topics. I talked about student mental health in some sessions. I, I went to sessions on uh, the zero emission buses. Um, I met people on the, on the exposition floor, um, and I brought that information back to the superintendent, and I think that, that the result of that is what we heard from John earlier today. Um, so that I'm excited to hear that that, that was a good connection. Um, the keynote speaker on the first night was meeting Sophia the Robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Um, and uh, it was interesting, but I... I Did you go up to dinner afterwards? Yeah, I wasn't thrilled. <laughs> um, but the, the keynote speaker for the, for the closing of the conference was um, Stephen Nelson. Yeah, Stephen Sharp Nelson. He's the cello player for the piano guys, and his presentation was so moving. Um, literally brought me to tears, um, and I just, it, it reminded me of, uh, you know, my passion for music education, and just to want to come back and, and say, you know, at any point, and if we heard it tonight, that, you know, community members are, and, and students and faculty are saying, we do a lot for sports in Iroquois, um, but we're not as good about addressing the needs of our, our performing, and uh, uh, what is it? Performing arts. <laughs> Performing arts and, and our uh, the, the visual arts. Visual arts, arts. yeah. Um, and um, and his his message was very strong in how much that actually does impact students. Um, and it is something that I think that we need to return to looking at and, and finding ways to continue to support 
advancing our visual and performing arts programs here at your point. Not that we do a horrible job, but I think we can be doing a better job. Um, ECSB is having their uh, legislative breakfast on November 16th. Um, there are uh, four legislators who are attending, including Patrick Gallivan. Um, he will be there, and uh, David D. Pedro is sending one of his staff members to it. So we, our two representatives will be there, and Heather Becker is going to be one of our speakers. So um, the deadline has passed, but you guys have an in. So if anybody has changed their mind and wants to go to that breakfast, just let me know by Monday so I can add you to our list. Um, and then the other thing is that I know that Heather had a family emergency, so she's not here tonight. And I know she was going to talk a little bit about one of the sessions she went to. And I went to a different one, but on the same topic of just, uh, restorative justice practices. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, ECSB is having our speed boarding event on, I think it's November 21st. And one of the presentations is on restorative justice practices. And so um, I think that would be a, another really great event for the entire board to try to go to together. Because um, I know that Heather has a, a passion for that now after going to her session. Um, and it might be cool us to be able to have more information by visiting with a local uh, school district that is winning some awards for their for their uh, program. Um, so mark the 21st on your calendar if you can go to that, that would be great. I'll have to get someone to represent me just so the board knows because I'm not here that week of the 21st. So board members are going, I'll get someone to attend in my place. Okay. Is there a deadline to sign up? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it is. Is it <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Speedboarding hasn't come out yet. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it, it, no, I think Dave's going to actually it. put it out. Uh, it's too soon. Too soon. <laughs> is there a time? Or do you know what time? We have an end. Uh, we have an end. It's <laughs> usually like 6 to 8 or 6.30 mm -hmm. to 8.30, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. I think it's, actually, I think it's 6 to 8.30. Because we, we have quite a few um, speakers. That's just one of them. Oh, sure. I know it's getting late. <laughs> um, gosh, I I also attended a different mental health um, a presentation. It was done by a, a doctor out of Boston, Massachusetts. It was an excellent presentation, um, as well as a, an AI presentation and trends in careers in AI, which um, and how. Am I not loud enough? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm getting tired. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm you can pull the mic to you, too. It's not. Um, so the AI, oh, there, wow. Um, the AI presentation was very good. It was just on um, what employers are going to be looking at as far as skill sets uh, for graduates, um, both coming out of high school as well as uh, uh, programs in college. So I thought that was very valuable information as well as networking um, and uh, meeting some vendors, which I have to give you some information. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. I'm the last one here that I think attended. Um, my participation there was really good because I enjoyed uh, spending time in the AI sessions, right? So mm -hmm. um, my take on Sophia was a little different. I mean, I was pretty <laughs> impressed with yeah. large language models and responsiveness to that and how that worked from a database perspective. Google always tells me I'm asking the wrong question. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, I, what I did find interesting and the really big takeaway is um, how kids today and students today are being educated and how AI does play such a pivotal role as a tool but it's not should not be the answer right and I and I think what that what what I really have took and taken away not only on the policy side but more so how we grade the students today of you know competency how do you understand the subject versus did you get the answer right or wrong because we can all seem to chat GPT everything and get the right answer, but do you fundamentally know the background? And I think it'll, we need to be on the, you know, we, we need to be in the forefront of that so we understand what's coming from a technology perspective, not only just the software interface that you have on your laptop, but, you know, hardware such as glasses and other pieces of 
AI, right? And so um, happy to say that we still have, you know, we've got a board policy with, or a policy I should say with AI, um, but constantly looking at that saying, you know, how are we doing? You know, how is this district evolving? Technology is coming out there. How are we best equipping the kids? Um, and then the other sessions I've, I, I spent was EV, EV buses, a bit passionate about that and uh, spending a little time with uh, John next week to go through uh, another um, little more information on EV. But the, the uh, NISBA conference was good and it was well worth the time spent. Good, good. Um, if everyone's done, we'll move to item. Actually, no? Can I just uh, throw in a, a couple of kudos to the II? Um, I had a couple of uh, email conversations with um, the principal and the, uh, one of the members of the PTO there. Um, I, I wanted to mention that the, the students, um, under the leadership of Mr. Goldman, initiated a, a, a candy drive, that, uh, collecting Hershey bars, to give to kids who are at Oshai Children's Hospital. And I just thought that they deserved uh, you know, some recognition for doing that. Um, and also that um, Lauren Cashmore is uh, working with our Kiw local Kiwanis Club to uh, collect funds to create, they're calling it the Red Hawks Nest Project. Um, and I, I want to get that out there so that if there's any news reporters listening to this and want to report on something worthwhile, uh, that they reach out to our um, II uh, PTO and, and get more information about how people can support that um, to create a really nice space for our II students. So uh, just wanted to make sure I mentioned both things tonight. Thank you, Jane. Um, anyone else have anything they want to share? Okay. We'll move to number seven, which is uh, the superintendent's report. So uh, the first thing I, I thought maybe a board member might mention it because I know you guys did attend this, but uh, Dr. Timms from the State Aid and Finance Considerations um, did give a quick presentation. John was prepared, so why don't you make your quick comment on that? Remember, I'm only allowed 30 seconds, so don't use all of it up. I think it was October 13th in the evening that he did a presentation. Uh, he's the... Um title uh, leads the statewide school finance consortium Rick Timms uh, spoke I think the summary is I think I hope that uh, Heather Jacobs and Jane Sullivan didn't weren't uh, surprised by any information because we had been presenting this kind of information in September to the board uh, he has concerns about state aid uh, the future state aid foundation aid all those kind of things and he was kind of very vocal about those uh, and has been for many years um, and also just explain the districts how they need to have reserves oh be ready for this stuff when it happens and if you have strong reserves you can kind of weather the storm and keep programs in place and all that kind of stuff so uh, luckily it was not nothing new that we heard and it was a good message again yeah it's not with the PTO all right thank you so much um, the next thing I'd like to just put out there is wrench about graduation gowns Alexis our assistant principal in the high school is still here was thank you for going that um, I'll let you take over at this point again. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So graduation gowns, we are moving towards a more unified and a more cohesive look. Graduation is inherently brings our students and our community together. So to have that more unified, cohesive look is really going to be impactful. Um, and what it's going to be is it's, it's a red gown, full red gown with a white stripe around the wrist. Um, you all have a picture of it. Perfect. Um, and we'll continue the tradition of honoring students who have earned the achievement of NHS wearing the blue robes as well as other uh, stoles or cords. We're going to continue that. That's important to honor those students. Um, and doing this is really, it's going to remove the chance of a student feeling set apart, having to make a choice about color, um, feeling embarrassed, uh, and altogether, it's really going to foster that unity and that inclusivity that we already prioritize and are working towards. Um, it also syncs up with the state suggestions as well as, if you look at the region as a whole, quick poll tells us that 34 schools in the area already do one single color across the board for graduation. An additional six schools do what we're looking to do, which is essentially the two-color tone based on their 
their district where it's you know a majority one color with maybe a stripe. Um, and then it's really only 12 schools remaining in the area that have the kind of the two separate colors uh, split. And of those 12, three are actually also making this move within the next year. Uh, so it, we're really syncing up with that direction. And I think most importantly, it's about unity. It's about cohesion. It's about prioritizing students um, being pulled together. And the timing of this couldn't be more perfect, um, from our opinion, with the Red Hawks uh, look and pulling us together with that as well. And as you said, the um, National Honor Society will still have their... They will still have the blue ropes um, and other, um, other accolades, sometimes through... Uh, music is an example. Um, Business Honor Society is a second example. There's a few others. Those are just quick ones. Um, they have different stoles and cords. They've already gone through that process working with us. Um, but those CTE will also CTE Honors, be they have a yes. stole. Yes, different students from Ormsby or Harkness program sometimes are in those as well. Sometimes going, someone going in one of the military branches might have one mm -hmm. that they wear. We had a beautiful standing ovation last uh, last graduation. I still uh, love uh, when I think of it. That student recently came back from his boot camp, but he had a really beautiful um, stole from the Navy. So certainly happy to celebrate those, and we'll continue to do that. It's just about bringing the rest, the whole look together, unity and cohesion. Okay. All right. Um, thank, thank you, you for that. But before you walk away, yes, because recognition is next. Um, we do have the president of the West Star Auto Group, Scott Beeler, coming in November yes. 22nd. Yes. I wanted to recognize you for putting that together and wonder oh, if you want to make any much. comments. Uh, also, thank you for connecting us with him. Um, so go ahead. Sure. So we're very excited. We've been, um, and credit really, it's been a team effort. Um, thank you, uh, Jim, first and foremost, kind of fostering some connections. It's been amazing as I've been talking with teachers. Um, how many people are like, oh, I know him, we're connected through this, and, and I think it, he's gonna be a really impactful speaker. Um, I've been working with multiple teachers so that we're gonna have it as, um, as much of an impact as possible uh, for that day. Uh, talking to uh, Scott Bueller, he, he's just excited to come in and share. Um, it was, it's, I've now had a few different conversations with him and um, the first one with Doug and, and a couple follow-ups, and it's just been really great to start to think through the messaging. Um, we're being purposeful in trying to also foster a little bit of a Q&A at the end, uh, which from classroom experience tells me we gotta prep our students a little bit in advance, but that's where I've been talking to teachers, and um, we're gonna have it so that there are certain classes that are gonna, we're gonna treat it like an in-school field trip, so certain classes are just gonna automatically go, but then we're also opening it up to those who might be interested. And we're also, the counselors are on board, we've got a lot of teachers on board. So it's been a really collaborative effort, which has been um, really wonderful as well. Thank you so much for leading that. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we, we talked about a, a student who's going into the Navy, I think you said? Air Force, the one student with the stole, Navy? Yes. Last year, Navy? Last year, graduate. Um, he is in Just quickly, the, he was Navy? Navy. Navy. So uh, so we mentioned him in Navy, but also the middle school government is collecting toilet cheese for veterans. So maybe one day he will be able to, when he's off at serving in the Navy, um, to support the cause, so people supported that. i also like to thank Danny's Helping Hands, a local nonprofit that assists and supports individuals and families in our area. Thanksgiving meals and Christmas gifts for those who are in need. More information is on our website, so if you're someone, I know a lot of people take part of that. And the Polar Plunge is December 6th at Woodlawn Beach. So if you feel like making your heart race, go take a plunge. The uh, next thing is, uh, <laughs> I like watching too. The Marilla um, group out there is working with the Marilla Kiwanis to create a pavilion. So they're doing fundraising, they're almost to the end. So if you wish to know, donate to that for your pavilion, which they started a little bit before the II pavilion. Um, it's really not part of the PTO. It, it's a, it's uh, um, Laura Cashmore is leading that. There is information on our website. Um, so those are two opportunities to donate for the future of our students and that's really exciting. Um, it'll parallel the whales 
that was started out there multiple years ago, and I still thank the group for doing that. Moving into sports, uh, the Conley Cup um, Sports Week uh, 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 Football Players of the Week. Uh, Justice was, was made it, so for Iroquois, he's on it. The girls volleyball has made into Class A finals at Tonawanda at 6 o'clock. Um, that'll be Iroquois versus Williamsville South at 6. Then we also have the football team is playing the Chuck Funky Bowl Class B finals. Um, East, Iroquois versus West Seneca East at 7 o'clock. I do not have the location on this. Across the street. Across the street. It's here. I think they'd tell me if it was here. Uh, for girls swimming, we did have Shea that was the ECIC champion in the 11 dive event. Um, then we also had our 200 free re relay that plays second in ECIC and Sophia earned third place in the 100 free. Um, and then I was going to talk about a uh, big thank you to the Hershey Bars that the fifth grade student raised to donate to Oshai's, but you already said that. So I'm done early. <laughs> but I love how the board always knows what's going on. I think that's really a great testament to the board for that information. Thank you, Doug. Uh, moving on to eight, recognition of guests regarding agenda items. Do we have any? No. Okay. We're going to move on to uh, number nine, discussion of agenda items, 11.01 through 23.1. I just want to take a brief moment out to thank um, Tops Education for donating $1,213.23. A big thank you to the Town of Wales for donating $12,500 for the uh, district um, resource officer program, and then East Scripps uh, for Wales, uh, $553.87. We definitely appreciate that immensely. Um, okay, and the uh, consensus agenda? Uh, I just want to welcome oh. Michelle Darner. She's joining us in the high school as a teacher aide, and as well, uh, Lauren Hanna, who's uh, going to be a full-time bus driver for us. So. Welcome them both to your coin. Welcome aboard. Okay. Uh, for the consent agenda, the basic purpose of the consent agenda is to act upon routine matters in an expeditious manner. Items placed on the consent agenda are determined by the board, president, and vice president in cooperation with the superintendent and are those which are considered common in the operation of the district and normally require no special discussion or debate. Board members have the ability and the responsibility of reviewing the consent agenda ahead of time. A board member may request that any item on the consent agenda be removed and inserted in an appropriate place on the regular agenda. Um, this one is new. Uh, the president will present the initial motion followed by a request for, for a second motion. So it means the consent agenda, I'm presenting it right now as the first motion. So I'm looking for a second. So a second. So it's first by the president, second by Jane. Um, all in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Bob's abstaining because he's um, on the agenda. All against? So we have one, two, three, four, five, five um, yeas and one dissent. No. One abstain. No. One abstain. Okay. Five positive. Okay, that was that was way one, too. One abstention. That was way She's too rough. <laughs> <laughs> You're just reading. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we do have some programs for phonics and phonemic awareness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, we got an order there. Uh, the recognition of guests. The, everything passed, right. so now we're at recognition of guests at the end. Move to 25. Move to 24. 24. Uh, all the way. Okay. Do we have any guests for any? We do not. Okay. okay. Do we um, need an executive session? We do not. Oh. I do not. Okay. I would like to uh, make the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? You can vote for this one. <laughs> any, any, any no's? Wait, he is involved. Maybe he should abstain. 
Okay, so that is uh, six in favor, no no's, the motion carries. We are adjourned.